Rachel. How you doing? Ah, I am in a state of mind where we just watched an episode of something where a character did an impression of another character. And it got Mm -hmm. me feeling a bit bummed because as somebody who's studied acting Mm -hmm. and as somebody who likes to joke around, I'm not really good at impressions. I can't really just pull out impressions. There are those people I know who can just do impressions like that. You work hard for impressions. I I just don't have the gift for it like Wang does in this episode. Like As soon as Wang started doing the impression, I was instantly charmed because... He was getting certain vocal tics of of McQueen down that it now made me realize that these were vocal tics that were in him that I was like, oh, yeah, he really does end a word like that with that kind of uh, at the end of it. And then I was noticing it throughout the episode. And that's how I'm feeling. I'm feeling just like I'm feeling good overall, but I was just feeling about like, man, I wish I could do impressions more so. The the only kind of impressions I do of obscure people I know, and it's just one of those things where it's like they are also Australian, so I can also do my fellow Australian friends. But all of the people that you do those impressions for that also know those people really appreciate I mainly have one person I can do who's my friend Will. Yeah. And he has a very particular nasal quality that I also have a nasal quality. So for that was laid by your impression of one of your teachers, mm-hmm. though. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, so, I had a teacher who had a very similar... Mr. Macaulay ca- started Mr. Macaul- it all. My, my English teacher, Mr. Macaulay, old beatnik, he had a similar vocal cadence to my friend Will, and I can do both of them, but mainly Will, because he's younger, and <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Macaulay, that old quality. But that's enough of that. Enough of my inabilities to do magnificent impressions like Wang in this. Uh, we're Yum Yum Podcast because of an amazing line of dialogue, Yum Yum. And I just want to say, yeah. I just want to say, yeah. it. in Star Trek Discovery, Nan, great character, said Yum Yum out character? of... N- <laughs> sorry, sorry. Icon. Said Yum Yum out of nowhere inspired me, inspired you. We're here today talking about things because of her. But I was looking at this episode of Space Above and Beyond and I was scratching my head going, God, who would have said Yum Yum in this? Because it was one where it felt like anybody and nobody could have said it. You, any thoughts? Any contenders? Evil corporate dude. Soul? That's his name, Sewell. Yeah. Sewer. I think he could have done it. You called him Sewer. Yeah, I did that on purpose. But he's a good guy. He's got a little cravat. <laughs> or a tie, a cravat tie. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. He's human sewerage. Okay, you don't you don't trust Aerotech? They no. Seem like, they seem like good people. No. I, no. <laughs> okay. Like, so... Very, very, very rarely do you get a good guy... Corporation? Conglomerate. Global... Conglomerate? Very rarely, very, very rarely in your sci-fi will you find a good global conglomerate. Um. One that's has the best interests of everybody at heart and uh, yeah. will protect lives. And that's why it's science fiction, because in reality there's so many that we can gather up and look at that do that, right, Rachel? That's why it's science fiction. Uh, but please run us down on what we're doing here, Rachel. What are we doing here? Why are we here? Why are these microphones in front of our mouths? What's happening today? On Yum Yum Podcast. You're here because I am your beautiful wife. And this is our beautiful... What are you laughing at? No, 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 no. I agree, I agree. I was also thinking about the yumling listening going, Why am I here, Rachel? Because you're my beautiful wife. And they're all cheering, (laughs) going, Yay! (laughs) She's my beautiful wife. (laughs) I did say... (laughs) Ryan, we're here. Yes, because you're my beautiful wife. Oh, 
Jesus. Yumlings, you've married Rachel. That's no. the commitment you make when you listen to the Yum Yum podcast. No. You, mar- you marry my wife. No, you're the one that says that you're married to every guest. That's true. That's I'm true. I'm not married to every yumling. No, that's incorrect. You're just married to some important ones. And guys, you know who you are. You know who you are. But no, no, go on with the spiel. <laughs> And that's Yum Yum Podcast. (laughs) So today's episode that we're looking over is Hostile Visits. (laughs) (laughs) Because I married you, that's why I do this to you. I didn't have to marry you. Hear that, guys? I'm off the hook. You guys can handle it now. I'm out of here. And then you just hear the door open, me run away, car start, rooms down. <sighs> okay, no, no, no. On Yum Yum Podcast, and this is Yum Yum and Beyond, we are looking at what show, Rachel? Space Above and Beyond. That's correct. We're looking at Space Above and Beyond. I am looking at it in the rewatch, and you are looking at it from the first-time perspective. So everyone can listen to this, because I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm just going to chip in every now and then with how I feel about going back to this series after a while, and you are going to inform us on what it's like to be looking at this for that first time, going back to a 1990s sci-fi forgotten gem of a show. Or is it not a gem? Well, we have to hear what uh, we all think about it by the time we get to the end, but uh, do you know what episode we're up to, Rachel? Do you, do you know what number we're on? Seven? Close. No, 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 no. If it was... Odd, it would be me reading. Mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an even. It's eight? N- it's number eight. Hostile visit. Do you remember what you thought this was going to be about? I believe my theory was, um, one of my theories was an alien situation where they're getting they got boarded. That's what you thought. You thought the chicks were going to get onto the Saratoga. That was your Not primary. Not the reverse. No. No, where they get on one of their ships is the pitch of Hostile Visit. Let's peruse what the DVD has to say the episode was about. After the 58th captures an alien bomber, McQueen suggests that it would be uh, it would help raise troop morale if they use the vessel to attack the alien's home planet. A plan that goes horribly wrong. That is hostile visit, according to the DVDs. If I had to quickly summarize it, it would be very similar. They start the episode off with action immediately. They are The Saratoga is being attacked. They're in a battle. They're in a battle. They're being attacked. People are running around. You see there are uh, members of the Saratoga crew freezing in the hallways and not sure what to do. They're afraid. They're they're petrified. They're unsure. They don't want to fight. There are those later we see that are outright dismissive of the fact that the humans could even win this war. So the episode does a pretty quick, easy job of telling us the stakes uh, that are the aliens attacking, but also how it's impacting the morale of humanity. And they disable one of the ships. They disable one. They've never done that before. They've nope. got their hands on a on an intact bomber fighter. So uh-huh. this is something unique. So McQueen suggests... An opportunity. McQueen suggests reel it in and let's study this thing. And that mm-hmm. is just the kickoff point of things to come in Hostile Visit. What did you think of this episode? It was great. That's it. It was great. Thanks for joining us, people. I uh, really like, loved having you here. That's 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 my first thoughts. It was great. What well, made it great for you? What was making this one stand out in any particular way? What was hooking you in, guiding well, you through this? What was the enjoyment it factor? It hit the ground running and it didn't let up. It was well constructed. 
in terms of the act structure and the storyline. It was well written, particularly in terms of the characters being themselves and feeling true, but also building on what we already know. Mm -hmm. And then being challenged by this experience. And then it was solid performances overall, some of them better McQueen than others. Mm -hmm. But all solid. It feels like the show has got its footing and it's solid within it now. I adored this episode so much. This was the shot in the arm that I needed. We've had A some boost in your morale. morale. We've had some very good episodes. We had Ray Butts, we had Eyes, and then we had The Enemy, which sucked. But what this gave me was a major understanding and appreciation for our characters. Those other episodes that have been good have been really well done in the realm of tying to the themes of the show, the world building of the show, the lore, the attitudes, but and whilst also attending to some character work. But this was the one that really uh, gave me everything I needed for the characters. Uh, All of them. This wasn't just oh, this is a a Shane episode like the previous, like the second one that we had, uh, The Dark Side of the Sun, where that was a great character episode for one person. This was a great character episode for the entire ensemble. Commodore Ross, I was already enamored by as a character because I love that actor, as do you, and him and McQueen bounce off of each other really well, but he was given a wealth of material in this episode as well, and he's not one of the core cast members. No, he's just one of the they people didn't we have. need to do that, but they did that. They took the time, and it really helps elevate the episode. And they give everybody their moment, their big moment, their big speech, their big conversation, their blow-ups, their low points, their highs, their lows, their joys, their sadnesses. But outside of that overt writing tactic of, oh, Shane has this beautiful speech about autumn on Earth and that endears us, the things that really uh, drew, drew me into the characters were these little moments, just these little fun moments, like Cooper pressing all the buttons on that thing to distract the guy while while Wang grabbed the thing off of him and fiddled around yeah. with that. And you bought it because that's the dynamic a, those two they're have. They're a team. They're a team. And there's just lots of these things like uh, Commodore Ross has a guitar and he's just playing the guitar and he's got his feet up mm-hmm. and he's just wearing his singlet and shorts and you just go, okay, yeah. wow, this is just... He's just chilling. He's, he's just being chilling. a person. He's being a guy. And you get that with so many of them throughout this where there's just these little moments of shading the characters in. Yeah, yeah. They were, yeah. even to a degree we've seen before, say Wang is into sports, they have a nice moment of back and forth at the beginning with the, the, the woman that's come on the ship, whose name I am forgetting, unfortunately, that he later flirts with. I just with. remember that she's also a lieutenant. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't like the smell of his shirt, and then she's even more uh, perturbed by the fact that it's for a sports team that she doesn't follow. And it was a nice little, oh, look, there's another person like him that's into sports, but they're into a different team, and that's cute. And then I didn't even think about how that was setting up a nice little back and Romance. forth between the two characters that we'll see blossom throughout the episode. Because, yeah, that was, that was something, I, well, now I'm talking about it, I'm like, of course. Of course, that was it. That was it. That's yeah. why that scene was there. But I look at it as nice little character moments. They don't get bogged down in the plot. The plot is interesting, like the sci-fi plot of them capturing the ship and they want to use it as a Trojan horse. That's still interesting, but it doesn't... <laughs> Space Above and Beyond in this episode 
rather would focus in on how this affects the characters on an emotional level and their dynamics to one another, rather than it being another, guys, we've got the most important mission of our lives. Meet here at zero, 100 hours, and we're going to fly over there and shooty, shooty action. We see shooty, them shooty, dwell. Bang, bang. Yeah, we see them dwell on this, and that, that was what I needed. West, if you had proof that Kylan Selena was still alive, would you give your life? I know she's alive. And I'll go because this is not a lost cause. This is a very well crafted episode. And it is very layered because everything has a lot going on underneath it and on top of it as well because we have all of the character stuff that's underneath all of these things happening like when Shane snaps at v- Voose yeah Devu yeah Devu they they sometimes call her Voose right yeah 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 sometimes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um and west kind of and west sort of apologizes for her because we've seen her act like that and mm. Wester's in particular has seen her act like that. Mm. Yeah. So it's not just now, it's then and why all being communicated in the writing and the performances. It folds in on itself. This one works so well because of the episodes before it. Even though we haven't enjoyed every episode and there's been flaws and problems with them, this one is bringing all of those threads together and weaving them into a nice tapestry here where you may not have in the past and you may not still now appreciate West as a character, but him doing that there is true to him as well, where he's a complicated guy as our le- as one of our leads, where he's this annoying, privileged, entitled little turd of a man, but also he can be extremely perceptive and empathetic, and he is willing to humble himself. He is willing to admit when he's wrong and, and, and apologize for that and actually try to improve upon himself. So him doing that there, where he apologizes on behalf of Shane is an act of him where it makes complete sense of the character, where it is him being this empathetic person, understanding the moment, but it's also a little bit of a a selfish act on his part as well, where he feels the need to be the guy that fixes it, where he he has to mend it because he's he's our hero, he's our lead, he's our boy. And Vanessa... uh, uh, And that's also the element of him being an older brother as mm, well. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because he is the, he's the older brother in his family, so he's trying to do that. And- he smooths it over. He takes responsibility for her emotional outburst mm, and mm. tries to make everything calm again, make everybody like each other and get along This is an episode that reminds you that there is an ongoing continuity for the characters as well as the story as as, as a being because we get the evil corporation is back, the chigs are back, the stakes of the war is really present here, Uh, conspiracies and uh, what's the real reason everything's happening are very, very much in the limelight and you're so satisfied to see them come back up again, at least I am, but they also are bringing forth all of the character continuity, the the back and forths between people, the ongoing relationships forming in amongst our 58th crew, as well as the traumas and the baggages and the motivations of each one of them being challenged in this episode in some minor fashion because each one of them is being asked to go on a suicide mission and they have to weigh up their values. They have to weigh up the reason they're here and if they're willing to throw that all away for the possibility of maybe winning the war or dying. 
And it is one of those... Or if not winning the war, me, changing me, the tide. Changing the tide. Yeah, yeah changing the tide for sure. Uh, there's a lot happening here. Let's kind of dig into some of that ongoing story beat stuff. Sewell was here, human sewage, as you call him. How did you feel about that? He's he he comes in yeah. and you go, and they just go there. He is. He's back. Yeah, I I was waiting on this. I was fully expecting him to come back. Just the way that they played that character. Like, the show is very clear, if not states explicitly, we're not done with this guy. This guy's not done with the 58th. Mm. He'll be back and it'll be something. Oh, yes. Do you want to go over what him and Aerotech are up to in this and uh, your overall thoughts on it? Well... Uh, they get brought in to take over the investigation of the Chig ship that they capture. And then McQueen's like, what the fuck? Why are civvies doing this? Mm-hmm. And Ross is just like, oh, they can do it faster. Ross is, a, Ross is to their defense pretty quickly. Yeah. And did that raise any flags for you at all? Because McQueen seemed blindsided by this. No, no, it didn't. But now I'm like, oh, yeah. Because at the end of the episode, Sewell even dangles a, a, a threat about something to him to make him go to the destination. I may have made a deal with the devil. Yeah, and we commented on the farthest man from home how McQueen... Uh, was having to follow what Ross was doing, and Ross was having to follow what Aerotech wanted, and yeah. he was very unhappy about yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's what I assume that, like, it's just come through the ranks mm. that this is what he has to do. So there's no point in questioning it. Yet it is important to note that McQueen questioning it here does tell us, the audience, that there is supposed to be a separation between the corporation, the, the civilians, and the military. That is very good to know, because in The Farthest Man From Home, we weren't too sure how much rule this corporation has over the Marines, because we know that Aerotech helped make their ships or help give them technology. That was very well demonstrated with the visuals of the doors, which yeah. were given to us again in this one very nicely. And we didn't know in the pilot and that first episode, Father's Man from Home, how much of the military and the corporations were melded together or yeah. not. But here they make a What's very... What's the structure of things? But here, with McQueen's objections and even Ross's uh, begrudging uh, reasons to have them here, it does tell us that they are supposed to be separate. Like, they benefit off of one another. They do work together, as do corporations and the military. They are things that do work with one another. But here... I I, I, I I didn't think about it all that much until McQueen did raise it. Then it made me have a bit of an existential dread throughout all of this about Aerotech being this corporation. Because before when I thought, oh, Aerotech is in charge of the military proper, like they have a more symbiotic relationship that's on the books, I was, more, I was content on that sci-fi level. Of, oh, well, yeah, that's just how this works. But now that they have told us that there is supposed to be distance between the two more than there is, it does add that level of unease. And why is Ross so obliging of this when you know it's gnawing at him throughout this entire episode? Yeah, and you want to know how I just answered that in my head? Yeah. Uh, human sewage has a note from the uh, chiefs of staff. Yeah. He- so I'm assuming that he Ross has been getting those this whole time. Okay. Yeah. That's the that's the way that my 
brain covered that up. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to be right in the long run. Obviously, I haven't seen it, and mm-hmm. I don't know if you would even remember if that was the case. I can't remember if fully. You were spoiling. I can't remember fully. What I what I got from this one was it came across when he presented that at the end that it took Ross by surprise. That he was, yeah, reacting to it in a way where he was, oh, oh, you have this level of authority now okay and he took it and he had to read it to double check its authenticity aerotech makes some compelling points in this one they have the enemy's ship they want to analyze it destroy it replicate it make their own trojans for future use and are they wrong no that's what makes it persuasive is that there is validity to that argument but you have that sense that you cannot trust them to do what will benefit earth as a whole only what will benefit them these guys knew things about this craft before we even engage it in battle i'll bet on it we just need that shake up in the stakes of this war because thus far what we've had is we've been down and out. Mm-hmm. We've seen many humans dead, we've seen the repercussions of war. And so as a viewer that isn't as exciting sometimes. No. So it gets a bit dull when it's just like dour. Not not just that. But Watching characters be helpless uh, and fighting so hard anyway, it can get very monotonous because there are heroes. So we know that they're going to come out on top in some way. Mm. They might lose a few people along the way, R.I.P. Ray Butts and Pags. And Monk. R.I.P. Monk. Never forget, he was a big guy. He had a wife back home. Remember Monk? He got shot when they were on that planet having a bit of a shootout at the beginning of that mutiny episode. He's a big guy. He had a wife waiting. Rachel's not Rachel's not responding. Because I don't care. I remember, but I don't care. Okay, well, R.I.P. Monk. He's not a Marine. He was a Marine. He was one of our boys. And we lost him. R.I.P. Monk. R.I.P. Butts. And R.I.P. Pags. <sighs> but how do you... Can I just say this? We just finished watching Battlestar Galactica. And this is before that reboot of Galactica. And there are some elements within this episode that made me think about Galactica a lot. Specifically, the ship. They capture the ship, and they go inside of the ship, and it's and it's mechanical yeah. and organic, and you need to stick your hands and legs and arms and bits into it. Yeah, that was... That was... Yeah. Hmm. But I was, uh, I was thinking of Battlestar, but I'm also like, uh, you know what? It's not that of an original idea for what it looked like on the inside. The merging of advanced technologies it sort of becoming more organic mm-hmm. rather than more artificial. Like, that made a lot of sense, but... Our heroes capturing one of their ships and then sticking their hands in it and squeezing stuff so that they can fire and fly. Yeah, and the Mm -hmm. the, the, the ooze, Mm -hmm. the ooze, and the lights, like the placement of the lights within the ships was reminding me a lot of Battlestar, obviously, because I'm... I've engaged with Battlestar before I've engaged with Space Above and Beyond. Chig Chig check-in. Uh, I think they're pretty cool. We got a little Chig action here. We got I some shooting. I love that they immediately start decaying. You take the helmet off and they start to just dissolve because they don't want the humans, I guess, to 
have their bodies. Yeah, I didn't know if that was a natural process or if it was like a cyanide tablet situation. Or is it how they react to when you take their to, helmets Yeah, to off? oxygen. Yeah, to oxygen. Or something. I don't, like I don't an know. element. Cooper, Cooper didn't know and he didn't want to <laughs> get busted for it. No. He didn't want to get in trouble for doing that. No, but uh, he... It was just he, a cute little moment. Of course he wouldn't resist because it's Cooper. It's Cooper. Uh, uh, yeah, the ships are cool. I like the interiors. I like how they describe it as this big bladder thing. And yeah. the information of how the Chigs operate their ships as if they're in an orchestra and you can see our human crew doing that as well. It's very cool. I think it's a neat way of having uh, an alien ship because when we see alien ships in shows, we usually see the ex- exteriors of them and how yeah. they fly around and they zip and zap and dodge and shoot and how they explode. And maybe sometimes we'll come to the interior and it's just like a normal cockpit but with some sci-fi crap in it. Yeah. like lasers or, or, or neon or lights. Just or just the consoles are arranged in a slightly different way. Yeah, they're a bit bumpy perhaps, so they've got big buttons or, or they've got buttons that sci-fi operate. Sci-fi for- loves to add ridges. Ridges or or levers. Oh. A little bit more brown than grey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But here, I like this weird bladder it it also yeah this bladder or what's the thing in the back of your throat your a uvula it reminded me of a uvula as well just how it hangs from the roof and it's just this thing that dangles there and i thought that was a, a really neat and we even get to see them fly it around the ship itself yeah. looked pretty cool it's a bit uh, yeah. different to the ones we've seen before uh, yeah but it was distinct and well designed in terms of the CG. It was one of the red ships as well. Mm-hmm. Very, very well done. You've had an ulterior motive from the moment you said go get it. What are you thinking? Sir, they reversed the ship's navigational computer. It came from a planetary body in the Ceres region. That is what I was thinking. For six months, we've been on the defensive. We haven't been able to even mount an offensive because until this moment, we had no idea where they were based. Now we know where they're from. Let's pay them a hostile visit. Throughout most of the episode, it is the promise that we are going to take this over there yeah. and attack them. Mm-hmm. We and, are taking back those reins, baby. But there's struggles because Aerotech just... is in the way. When they're there, they're in the way, and then when they're leaving, they take all the stuff with them. They leave the ship, but they don't give them any information. No, they delete they, very mm. specific pieces of information that are important. Clearly they kept important but, ones for themselves, though, because yeah. he was on his little mobile phone. Yeah. In space. Like, yeah, we got that. Uh, like, we got what we needed. We've got it covered. And they're trying to make it impossible for the military to do what they want to do. And I feel like Aerotech lied about the launch window to try and rush them, to try and get them to quit (laughs) as well. Uh, But McQueen is too stubborn. Because if it was Ross on his own, Ross would have cancelled the mission. He would have just let Aerotech have the ship. Yeah. That yeah. there would be no even an idea of an emission. If it was up to Ross, they would have blown it up. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that's the true. truth. Uh, I mean, and fair. They didn't yeah, know if but, it was I alive. Mean, if McQueen oh, pr- stepped aside, praise to if. praise to direction in this episode as well. Very well shot. The lighting was particularly great in this. I love when they're in the action sequences and the bridge of the Saratoga goes into that red lighting. Oh, when the generator and battery go out and they're in the emergency lighting as well. Like, the red light's going off Mm -hmm. when they get stuck in the base when everything shuts down at the start of the episode. It was so beautiful. 
but so ugly and grimy at the same time without being over stylized. And it's just like, that's, that is hard to do. That's hard to nail. And I, I really do think that they did in that particular moment. Yeah, they had a beautiful shot as well when McQueen was rushing down to stop Saul from leaving and you see these narrow, tight corridors packed with people and he's brushing his way through them and and shoving his way through. That whole sequence was just brilliant to look at and then when he runs up to the door that's closed and you see his face looking absolutely gutted through that triangular window. Yeah. A great sequence there with a what with with a particularly striking visual to end it on. And yeah. there's lots of to ad breaks where it just ends with McQueen's mm. worried face and that's a note I have. Good idea. Great idea. Great idea because it makes me care to follow up in the next scene. I I, I want to turn back around and stay with him. He's such a great character, played by such a great actor in the role. Uh, I I uh, I, lo- I really did love the impression scene as well, and the way that it it feels very just added in because there was an opportunity for it. Yeah, and I like the way that they transition back to what was meant to be his entry point. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. Or it was like he makes some kind of comment like that, and then it's like add back to normal dialogue. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. For as I said to you after we watched it, a uh, fun little bit of trivia about that is that actor who plays Wang, and pretty much it seems like everybody would do their impressions of of uh, of McQueen, of that actor, because he has such a unique, you know, such a, a recognisable voice, just a very distinct voice, and it's just fun to do his voice, I guess. And I think, apparently, according to some trivia, he got tired of that. <laughs> like, he, he seems like a serious guy in real life, and he seems like he got a little bit tired of everybody doing impressions of him but that's fine because that makes it funnier for me and I think for them as well and I think for them because I listen to commentary tracks and they all do their impressions of him still so eh. and that is them writing that into the show and this is again the strength of they're getting to know the cast better and so they're They're, writing to their their strengths you and I were laughing in appreciation and with the show so much you i think it's fair to say you're a mcqueen fan i'm a mcqueen fan but if i had to pick your one of your second favorite characters yeah from just your reactions the last few episodes uh-huh it has to be cooper hawks <laughs> you really react well to Guilty. cooper hawks he's such a uh like we've said unique character to have in your ensemble and they're exploiting that they're not leaving it to wither like they have in previous ones and they're not just making him an angst machine exploited is has too much of a negative connotation because they're not overdoing it for me so it doesn't Mm. feel like it's exploitation they really are just utilizing the opportunity that the character presents. And they're doing that with almost all of the characters in the ensemble. The actors uh, have been given the ability to play into these people more. Uh, because I, I, I think you and I both agree that the entire ensemble, the entire cast, showed from the pilot that they're all capable, that they're all good. They just needed to be given better material. And they've been getting better material, a material that is catering to their strengths. And everybody gets that. Uh, you know, uh, Wang was particularly great in this one as yeah. well. We keep praising him throughout because he's not been given the proper no. spotlight. He's not going, he doesn't feel like he's going to get a big character episode on his own, but as somebody who is in our show, he does have his he moments. He gets his time. He gets his time. and He's not going to get his episode, but he gets his time. 
He flickers in and out, and I put this down to the actor more so than the writer. Yeah. He flickers in and out of being the comedic side relief to the exposition, to the surprisingly dramatic character. Mm -hmm. And the actor flicks between all of those with relative ease, honestly. And again, the material does help. We saw last episode he couldn't do that because the material was fucking awful. Here, he was doing all of those things between lines, between scenes, mm-hmm. between breaths, and it was it was masterclass acting on his part. He was always on. He wasn't waiting for his lines or his moment. He was being his character the whole fucking time with the same level of commitment throughout the whole thing. Mm. And it's really lovely to watch somebody bring that level of commitment as well as that quality of a performance Mm. to something that lots of people wouldn't bother to bring that. I, um didn't come here to talk about this. Do you want my hypothesis on why you did come here? It's, uh, kind of the going rate for me to finally meet someone who interests me the night before I leave on a suicide mission. If I had to pick a favorite scene, now... There are better scenes, but my favorite scene was actually when Wang went to go check on the ship and talk to the lady. Yeah, that was very cute. It wasn't just cute, but it gave a dramatic nuance to the character of Wang. As well as setting up the stuff at the end. Yes, but it gave him... Everything is pulling double duty in this episode. It made this it made the drama more present for me because if Wang, who's the silliest character, if he's having a moment of pause about this and having to reflect about his future, it made me think about how this mission is more important than I may have thought it was before. Because when West is clipping his nails or Vanessa is having her problem with her jaw or Shane is talking about autumn. Those are things I expect of those characters. And that's good. Yeah, That's good and all. Mm -hmm. But those characters are are, are, are pitched in the series thus far as being great uh, people to go to, to let Mm -hmm. us know what the drama and the gravity of it all is. Yeah, But to have somebody like Wang, who has been a little bit more goofy and lighthearted to have him just, be left aghast He's the at one this. with the dirty shirt. He's the one with the dirty shirt. And if he's having to stay up late at night and wander around and look at the ship and really think over what he wants to do next, it makes me think about what they have to do and next. And almost not do it. Yeah. Like, he's the one that doesn't show up at the time. Mm. But he makes it before they leave. That was my favorite scene. I just really liked the lighting, the banter, the chemistry between those two actors. And for somebody who isn't given enough as a character, they gave him so much in that singular scene. Yeah, I I really like what they're doing with him. What was your favorite uh, scene, or if you had to pick a standout moment for you? Because there's a lot. There's a lot of McQueen and Ross. There's a lot of Cooper moments that you particularly gravitate towards. Even West had his great yeah. moments here as well that you were enjoying when we were watching it. You were like, yeah, that was pretty good. One that we haven't mentioned yet that I I adored. I just adored every second of this scene. And it's the one where McQueen goes to Ross again and says, if one of them doesn't turn up, I want to go. And they have that conversation of, like, after all we did to your people. The guitar scene. The guitar scene. 
And when he says, who am I to tell somebody what to die for? That fucking scene is doing so much work. Just eat it up. Just eat it up. We could do a whole episode about that one scene. It's doing so much work without you realizing how much work it's doing until you really think about it. I mean, at the base level, at like the most surface level, you look at it and you go, oh, Ross plays guitar. Like, that's the first thing you immediately know when you go into the scene. You're like, like oh, oh, he's playing a bit guitar. It's cheesy, isn't it? Oh, I didn't think so. But um, I was like, oh, he's playing guitar. Oh, that's cute. That's cute and cool. <laughs> and then that's you get their relationship. You get their relationship in a way that we haven't seen it before, where we know that they have a deep connection to one another, that they're brothers in arms, and that they love each other. Ross would be willing to sacrifice himself for McQueen, and McQueen would be willing to sacrifice himself for for Ross. But this is something greater than that here, and. I was taken aback when when Ross acknowledged what they've done. Like, after all we've done to your people, you're still willing to do this. It made me th- it made me uh, like him more as a character. I, I I I this isn't a spoiler to say, but like he is in the show a lot. Like Ross is in the show a lot, but he never gets to be in those opening credits as like one of the main cast members, and I don't know why. He's in, I think, like, 15, maybe 16 or 17 episodes. I'd have to double check. But, like, he's in a good amount of episodes. We've had some way he hasn't been in there already. But, like, his presence is enough for me to think that he should have been listed as a main. And if this ever got a second season, I, I wouldn't doubt he would have been listed as a main if he if he was in the second season. Um, I can't remember the, the eventual fate of Ross. It's one of those things that's, like, the back half. But, like... At this point, he's he's so clearly defined as a character and has such presence and is just there that I, I forget that he isn't suppo- like he isn't considered one of the main characters we follow, especially after a scene like this. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, he's one of the ones that you talk about all the fucking time, too. Because he's so great. Come on. When he Oh, he is fucking amazing. But it, I forget that he's not in the opening credits because <sighs> it, it just it feels right. <laughs> like him and the guitar. How did you feel about Ross in a singlet, shorts, playing a guitar? How did you feel about that? And how he gives McQueen his pick as like, this is me taking, taking this with you. This is as, like, this is as good as taking me with you. Oh, Bless, bless. I loved it. I re- really appreciated, particularly in this episode, how this show just does not do non diegetic music. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I heard the strumming and I was like, he's got a guitar. What's going on with him having a guitar? <laughs> And then I also loved that he had the, like, not only was he just strumming the guitar, but the little things that show you that he's a seasoned player, particularly, like, with the pick and the way that he's holding it. Mm -hmm. And I'm forgetting the name of it, but he has, like, the slider bar Mm -hmm. on his finger. He's playing the blues. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, It's just rich. It tells you so much. They're learning, and we've been saying this in pretty much every episode, showing us is more important than telling. These little things, these little tidbits, these little drops of information through visuals and or implication rather than him saying outright things is is so much more beneficial. And I even really liked how we got an explanation for the guitar as well, like what it means to him. 
in this and in why this, he's pulled it out now that he uses it so he can forget about how he's the commodore of the ship and that he's important and that he has to worry about what was it 15,000 people's lives that's how many are on the Saratoga and you go wow well, that's a lot of people and i uh that scene really is one of the greats of of this that we've of of the show we've seen thus far it's just two guys talking to each other being real with one another and accepting each other and there's no animosity there's no friction there's back and forth there's no no homo either oh i ship him <laughs> oh i ship him i ship him i think everybody ships him I think there's some fanfics about those two. There's some fanfics about the. I see. I I see it. I think I there's see mainly it. fanfics about Cooper and McQueen because they're very you know mm, mm, bumping those. You got you got the young bump, guy and the old guy. Bumping those nipple necks. Yeah, you got you, the two the two you know the, the young angsty guy and the older angsty guy, and uh, McQueen <laughs> yeah. is dead set on joining the mission. He wants to fly. He's feeling really low, and he needs a he morale want, boost. He wants some control back. Because he's been grounded because of his injuries from the chigs and the pilot. And, yeah, talking about it, he needs it as a morale boost for himself. Because he's seeing that everyone's low on morale, but he himself is. Yeah. He needs this for his own benefits. He sees benefits. it and he feels it. Yeah, they even question throughout this that... Well, McQueen, this his isn't motivation. just his motivations, and they talk about how he has a deep connection to military history, which is demonstrated mm-hmm. when he uh, reveals that he always keeps in his in his flight vest jacket thing the, the poem from the kamikaze pilot. Be- yeah, yeah, the, yeah, and how he is just aware of these things and it makes sense. If I have a critique for Space Above and Beyond as a series, and I think we're far enough in that I can say this with ease and I don't know if you will disagree or not this is a show okay you know how Babylon 5 is made by a nerd (laughs) yeah uh, yeah JMS is a big fucking nerd and you have episodes where it's like oh King Arthur visits the station and we get Mm -hmm. Arthurian legend crap and you go okay this is written by a nerd who likes Lord of the Rings and the Prisoner and uh, so on and so forth you know what they like Preferences. You know what they like, and they put it in, and it can be obnoxious sometimes. Yeah. These this show weirdly, they're they're clearly nerds, but they're military nerds. They specifically know a lot about World War Two history from all sides. This isn't just all American facts. They're bringing in facts about this, and to me, it comes across a little too blatant of. The writers and the creators going, I know this. I'm having fun. I know. Aren't you having fun? And it always comes across as weirdly the characters becoming the writers telling us an interesting military fact. And there is a more natural way that they could do it. And they Um, have been getting slightly better at it. uh, I, well, maybe they're just not doing it as much. Maybe I don't that's... know. <laughs> or here's what I, I was going to ask uh, you. No. Here's what I was going to ask you because there was this there was this moment where the music was swelling and West was giving a, a, an inspired but slightly corny speech, and I sat there going, "This is this is the show. This is the show." Yeah. Where yeah. we have the awesome McQueen thing, we have the spaceship battles, the music, and this was to 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 my eyes as somebody who's viewed the series before. Uh, it came to me that the hostile visit was one of the first real episodes that totally encapsulated what this series was. I repeat again, it's found its fate. Yeah, as a first time viewer, you've seen some of these elements be here and some of them be used all at the same time, but not all of them. And no. I was curious of if you felt the same way, because you've watched enough TV where you yeah. go to a point and you go, okay, this this is this is the show. For better or for worse, like mm-hmm. even some of the corny things, you go, well, that's just the show. I am not as... I'm not as confident that this is the show. 
because I am still in that point of guessing how it's going to change. I think mm. all of the core elements are there, but I don't know how or if they're going to change the playing field. Right. Yeah, I understand that. And this is a two-parter. This is part one. Yes. Of a uh, two-part story. I want to give myself credit because a part way through the episode, I turned to Ryan and I was like, is this a two-parter? Because I just was like, they've left too many things open and they've opened up too many things to get it all resolved in the way that they do in this show because they have very direct plots. Yeah. And as soon as it was like over halfway through the episode and they hadn't left on the ship, I'm like, this is at least a two-parter. And as a first part in a two-part story, you haven't seen the second part, how do you feel about it in terms of that being a two-parter? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a big moment in the war. It's a big moment for our characters. It's really good to see them getting the chance to let their ideas breathe because we would have missed out on so much, so much amazing, amazing character stuff if they were fast-forwarding through the plot. After all we did to your people, why would you give your life? I would consider it my gift to you, sir, to have you wonder why I did. Who am I to tell any man what he should give his life for. Another critique I have. Another mm-hmm. negative. This episode isn't perfect. It no, has some lazy it's moments. Good. It, I think it is one of the best we've watched. I would I would rank this pretty high up, but it it's does a yum, take yum. yum yum. Oh, we're wanting to rate it already. Yeah, it's a yum yum. Yum yum. There's a moment of ADR bullshit where the camera's shaking. We've got so many close-ups. We don't know what happened, what's happening. And then you hear ADR. Think of Wes saying, I found an escape pod. It's like, okay, where did you Why find this? Why did you find this now? Now? Why After didn't we know about this before? After this fucking reading. That would have been a great you moment. You investigated the whole fucking ship. And when we and were in like, the ship, boop, maybe you boop. could have had our characters find it there in the first act. So then in the third act, it comes back, or, you know, the fifth act for or, TV. And so we have a setup and payoff if that's instead one of some of the bullshit. That human sewage tries to hide from them. Yeah, then, sure, sure. If we see him hide the thing and then it's revealed that they find it. Right, and so that was a piece a piece of bullshit. It but, was a piece of bullshit, yes. Uh, to give some closure on the episode, uh, one of the behind-the-scenes trivias on this, if you are curious to know, is this was made into a two-part story because the show was getting fucked around already. They were pushed to different times. They weren't getting the ratings that were required. So, as a part of a effort, it was in the it was a certain time of year when this aired. So, they usually when okay. you air this at a certain time to pick up the audience, you need to give them a big deal. So, yeah. a two part story mm-hmm. is what you give them a double parter to draw people in and give those viewerships numbers a boost up. Yep. And so that's why we have a two part story eight episodes in. Usually, you have a two part story in the direct midpoints mm-hmm. of a season or the end of a yeah. season. Uh, that isn't a, a golden rule, of no, course. Not every yeah. show does that, but. Uh, but it, this it is something that is to, of to note down that they are already getting forced to do things. And there was also a little bit of a back and forth I was reading about when it comes to the chicks, where they as creators were getting pushed into having to reveal or give us more chicks because of what purpose, do you think? If you had to, if you had to guess, yeah. business minds 
interfering with Action trade. Action figures. Oh, you got it. Merchandising, merchandising. Play the clip from Spaceballs. Merchandising, merchandising. Where the real money from the movie is made. And they seem to have stuck to their guns where they, they I was reading an interview or, or some statements by by one of the creators and they were saying, we want to take the slow approach, build up to it, give one piece at a time. We're getting pressured to do these things, but we're going to try and stay yeah. true. And you and can we, see that. We where got a, a good little dollop of information about the chicks in this one and physically they were there for Mm -hmm. for a bit and this is an example of a creative compromise that works where we are getting more chick stuff we've got a spaceship yeah we can have that toy if we want we got them again in their armor oh they take their helmet off and they're melting and that's great but it isn't just eight episodes in hey, here are the chicks, here's what they look like, here's their new armor that they have, or here's their motivations. It's still staying true to the creative vision of the show while still appeasing the network and Mm. the business minds in an episode that is harshly critiquing corporations and the business minds. Ooh, how, how weird. Another little detail, I already mentioned it, but Sewell is talking on a mobile phone to somebody and he's in space. I just want to know how the phone works. I mean, it's the future, so it could just be a, it's a space phone, but I just found that very amusing. Yeah, because we haven't seen that before. It's just like he has that ability to easily communicate, assumably with somebody back on Earth. But McQueen has to physically run down there to try and mm-hmm. stop. And it comes across like the Saratoga has a difficult time getting in communications with other ships in the area. But uh, that is uh, basically it. Hostile visit. I will read out the title of the next episode, but I want to hear what do you think it is going to be about before I read the title out? Because this is obviously leading into something. So there's enough within this episode for you to just have a guess at what the natural progression would be in the story. Well, they're going to go after the wild cards Mm -hmm. and find out some more information about the chicks and it's going to end up being more beneficial for the corporation than for the Marines. And what about the wild cards? What's happening with them, do you think, in this second part? Um. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think they're going to have to hide on the planet. Okay, well, I'm going to give the title for episode nine, and this may sway what you think if you've yes. got some memory. The next episode is called Choice or Chance. Does that influence you now Mm -hmm. in any way? How are they going to come back? (laughs) Who, Rachel? Who? Who's coming back? A good friend's who? Uh, Well, we're going to, I assume that we're going to get a porn star again. Felicity herself. <laughs> yeah, Choice of Chance really does tell you silicate, yeah, silicate, silicate somehow. It does. Now, now, hearing the name and having seen this first part, does that raise your eyebrows up even more? Because yeah. you, you are like, how did they get involved in this? Yes, I see even more why you wanted me to guess before the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's completely different now. Yeah. Completely different. How does it feel to be invested in the show's lore enough where a title like that, you understand what's going to be in it? It makes me happy. It makes me happy because it's good TV. And you're invested enough. Yeah. Oh, man. As stated, our rating is yum yum for this yum 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 uh so that is all we have 
We've done it. We've talked about Space Above and Beyond. We'd love to know your thoughts, your opinions on this episode, as well as any of the ones we've discussed already. You can hit us up at our email, yumyumpod at gmail.com, as well as any of the social media platforms under Mm -hmm. Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. We're on them. We include them in the description of the episode. This series, Yum Yum and Beyond, Mm. is something we do on our Patreon. So patrons listening to this, you already know this, you already hear this information, but for you people out there listening to this on the main feed, this was a Patreon series, and uh, by the time this comes out, We've covered this show, so if you want to skip ahead and get all of them and hear every single take on it, come on over to our Patreon, where you can be a member of a group Discord, interact with our fellow yumlings, and get a buttload of content. All of this, again, is in the description below. Thank you all so much for joining us and listening to us. And Rachel, I hope that the second part doesn't let us down because there's always that thing with two parts where it's one, hard. one's going to be better than the other or maybe they're both equal or who mm, knows? It's very hard to balance them. But we do know one thing. We do know? We do yeah, know. We do know one thing. Pags won't be here for it. Because we lost him too soon. We lost Pags too soon. Hey, in this show, I know it wasn't this episode, but it was the last one. We've yeah. learned a few things. We've learned that payback's a bitch, fate's a bitch, and there was something else that was a bitch last week. Was it was fear's a bitch? I can't remember. Something else was a bitch. Yeah. I hope that next episode we learn what else is a bitch. Not Pags though. He was a champ. Here's the Pags.